Welcome. In this video, we'll be looking at the flexibility method for continuous beams. This is an introduction to the formal notation as well as the matrix formulation. Previous videos have introduced the method conceptually. Here we have multiple degrees of indeterminacy and that requires a more formal approach. This is our example problem. It's a three span continuous beam. These are 10 foot spans and we have uh, loads at mid span. There are loads of one kip on the left hand spans. In the flexibility method we need to choose a primary structure. The primary structure that I'm using for this problem is one that has hinge releases above the supports. The primary structure is shown here along with the redundant internal moments that are labeled R1 and R2. R is the notation that we use for the redundant forces, be they forces or moments, and the subscript numbers them so that we can keep track of our work. In what follows, we'll be looking at the deformations at the deformed shape of the primary structure in three different cases. First, applying a unit load at R1. Next, applying a unit load at R2. After that, applying the applied forces of one kip over the left hand spans. Then, we'll make sure that all of those deformations are consistent. Let's get started. Here's the primary structure with a unit load for M1 you notice that there's no other load on the primary structure. Let's look at the deformed shape. The structure will deform as is shown there. And we've of course introduced a, an error. We've created sharp changes of angle where in reality the beam needs to deform smoothly over those supports. One of the angles is shown uh, right here if we continue the slope for each of the two segments, the angle of interest is the angle between those two slopes. In reality, that should be zero. For the other support, the angle of interest is shown there. Let us introduce the formal notation. We will call each of these deformations F sub ij. And F sub ij is the deflection at the ith redundant due to a unit load at the jth redundant. We need to attach a sign convention. And the sign convention is positive in the direction of FII. That is when the subscripts are the same. We'll see just in a second how that plays out. Let's first use this definition to identify, to label these two angles. The angle on the left hand side is the deformation at R1 at the first redundant due to a unit load at the first redundant. So we label it F11. The other one is still due to the first redundant. The force applied in this case is a unit load at R1 on the left hand roller, but we're looking at the deformation now at the location of R2. So this one is labeled F. 2, 1, the deformation, the deflection at the second redundant due to a unit load at the first redundant. F11 identifies the positive direction for any deformation at that location. So the arrow shown here is the positive direction for any F with the first subscript being 1. Because we haven't done F22 yet, we actually don't know the sign convention yet for the other location. We'll see that in the next slide. However, I'll let you know that it will be actually in the same direction as the positive direction for the F1J. Now, how do we determine the values of these? Well, to do this, we'll go to our tables. Here, I'm showing you the display shape for a simply supported beam for a moment applied at one of the ends and we're interested in this angle right here which is the 
angle at the location where the moment's applied. It's F1 and it is M L over 3 EI. Now we're computing this for a unit load, so M is equal to 1, so it's just L over 3 EI. Here we have on the left hand side of that hinge L over 3 EI and on the right of that hinge L over 3 EI. So the total angle between the tangents of the two sides is going to be twice L over 3 EI. Now let's go back to the diagrams to find what F21 is. That's related to the angle on the other side here, the far side, the, the side where the moment is not applied. We're looking at this angle F2, which in magnitude is L over 6 EI. Remember that we're substituting 1 for M because it's a unit load. And we ignore the sign on this table because we're just doing it according to the sign convention that I defined for you. That's for the angle on the right side of the middle span, but the angle labeled F21 is the same, and that's L over 6 EI. Let's move now to M2 equals 1. For M2 equals 1, we're looking at the same primary structure, but now we're looking at the load at the other release that we made. This is the deformed shape. I've labeled the angles already. We recall our definition. We can label the deformations accordingly. On the right side, it's the deformation at the second redundant due to a force at the second redundant, hence it's F22. The other one is the deformation at the first redundant due to a unit load at the second redundant. So it's labeled F12. The positive sign convention for the F1s was already determined on the previous screen. The sign convention for the F2s can now be determined now that we know the direction of F22. The values are going to be the same. For F12, it's simply that angle at the far end, at the end where the moment is not applied. For F22, it's going to be twice the angle where the moment is applied. One for the left side of the hinge, one for the right side of the hinge. The work is exactly the same in both cases. Next we move to the applied load. The applied load is shown on the primary structure, as is the deformed shape. We need to again identify the angles that we're looking for. The angles are the differences between the slopes on either side of the releases that are indicated here. And our notation is as follows. We will call these delta. The delta sub i is the deflection at the ith redundant due to the applied load. Careful with the sign convention. The sign convention switches. These will be called positive if they're opposite to the direction of the FIIs. In other words, opposite to F11, opposite to F22, and so on. These are the positive directions for the deltas. If you rewind a little bit, you'll see that these arrows are in the opposite direction than the ones that were drawn on the previous slides. Let's identify these values on the diagram. The delta 1 will be at the location of R1. Delta 2 will be at the location of R2. Let's now find these values on the diagrams. Here I'm showing the diagram for a simply supported beam with a point load, a distance B from the left end. The special cases are down here. When B is equal to L over 2, the angles F2 and F3 are both the same in magnitude and they're equal to PL squared over 16 EI. So delta 1 is composed of a PL squared over 16 EI on the left side of the hinge and another one on the right side of the hinge. So the value of delta 1 is 2 PL squared over 16 EI. The value of delta 2 corresponds to a single rotation of PL squared over 16 EI. So now we have all of the values that we need. Let's now look at these three deformed shapes all together and make sure that the resulting deformation is consistent with the original structure. These are the three deformed shapes from our previous work. The first one corresponds to R1, the second corresponds to R2, and the third one corresponds to the applied load.
you'll notice that the first two are scaled by R1 and R2, and that's because the F factors were computed with a unit load. But we need to now account for the actual magnitude, the actual unknown magnitude of those internal forces. What compatibility means, or consistent deformations, as we've also called it, is that there should be no difference in angle at either of those two rollers. We see that at all of those locations where we have angle changes, there is a sharp change in angle between the two sides of the beam. We need to add and subtract all the F and delta factors so that those angle changes all go to zero. So we'll look at each location in turn. Let's start at the first roller. At this roller we have F11 scaled by R1 added to F12 scaled by R2. Both of those go in one direction. They have to equal the value that goes in the other direction or the delta 1. At the other roller it's a similar story. We have F21 scaled by R1, F22 scaled by R2. Those added together have to equal the deformation labeled delta 2. The terms F11, F12, F22, F21, delta 1, and delta 2 all depend on known quantities, so those are all known. What's not known are the values R1 and R2. So we have here a system of equations, two equations, two unknowns. We can solve for R1 and R2. So let's proceed to that solution. Here I'm just recopying the equations and what we're going to do is we're going to look at the system of equations and recast it in matrix form. Let's look at the first row, make sure we can recover the first row. The R1 multiplies the F11, the R2 multiplies the F12, those are added together, and that's equal to delta 1. Similar explanation for the second row. We'll call the matrix the flexibility matrix, the vector of R's the vector of redundant forces, and there's no need to give a special name to the delta vector. We'll just call it delta. Symbolically, we can call the matrix F, lowercase f, we can call the vector of redundant forces capital R, and we can call the delta vector delta. All of these are bolded to indicate that they're vector or matrix quantities. And we can solve for R by multiplying each side by the inverse of F to obtain R is equal to F inverse delta. Let's now proceed to solve this numerically. To plug in values, we only need the given quantities. L is 10 feet. EI will cancel. The load P, the applied load is one kip. We need to make sure to convert feet to inches. Uh, it's not really required here because EI cancels, but typically EI is given in kips and inches. so we need to make that conversion. These are all the values that are given for the individual terms. You can see that this information is enough to calculate numerical quantities for all of these terms. We can plug these into the matrix formulation, give it to Excel, give it to MATLAB, give it to your handheld calculator. This is a two by two, so you can even do it by hand. Whichever way you want to do it, we can obtain the following result. R one is equal to 21 kip inches, R2 is equal to 6 kip inches. So now we know the unknown internal moments at those two locations. Let's finish the problem by interpreting physically what that means. The remaining quantities we will find simply by standard statics. What I'm showing on this diagram is the primary structure with the applied load and with the redundant moments, but now using the known values of the redundant moments. And what we need to do is separate out each of these different segments. So for instance, the left-hand segment looks as follows. We have the applied load of one kip, the moment of 21 kip inches, and two unknown vertical forces at the two ends. The center segment looks as follows. Uh, the one kip force, the two moments on either side of the beam, and two different unknown vertical forces. The right-hand segment looks as follows. 
the single moment of six kip inches and an unknown pair of forces. In this case, I'm using vertical equilibrium to know that the two forces are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So we need to find these five unknown forces, F1, F2, F3, F4, F5. I'll leave that to you as an exercise. Uh, after you do that, uh, you can check your answers that are given here. If I were interested in the reactions at the two interior rollers, I would need to sum up these two forces. So the reaction at the first interior roller on the left is F2 plus F3. The reaction on the second interior roller on the right is F4 plus F5. We can also draw shear force diagrams, we can draw bending moment diagrams, and, and we can obtain a full idea of, of what the response quantities are for this structure. So let us summarize quickly what we've done in this video. We determined a primary structure, we chose a primary structure with hinge releases, and we labeled the unknown redundant forces, in this case internal moments, by the variable r, with a subscript indicating a numbering scheme so we can keep track. For each redundant force, we looked at the deformation, we looked at the error introduced by the release, we called the fij the deflection at the ith redundant due to a unit load at the jth redundant, we defined a positive sign convention in the direction of the F11, F22, F33, and so on. The F terms with the equal subscripts. We found the quantities in this case by looking at the chart. There are other methods that we'll see later. We also looked at the applied load. Uh, we defined the term delta the deflection at the ith redundant due to the applied load. The positive sign convention was opposite to the sign convention for the redundant forces. In this case, we found the values of delta by looking at the charts. We enforce compatibility, which means in general that the deformations introduced by our releases need to be corrected for so that in reality they are not there. In this particular case, the deformation is a discrete change in slope at each of the hinge locations. So we set up equations that enforced a smooth slope at those locations, and then we defined the problem in matrix form. We translated the problem to a matrix formulation where the final answer can be obtained as the inverse of f times delta all of which are known quantities. Finally, we applied statics to find any other quantity of interest. This method can be applied to a problem of any level of indeterminacy, NOS of 2, of 3, of 4, and so on. Uh, the same matrix calculation applies in any case. It also applies to any primary structure. Of course, some primary structures are more difficult to compute with than others, so this is definitely a, a difficult part in this procedure is choosing the correct primary structure. But the method itself, the definitions, the matrix formulation, and so on, and the general procedure that I described applies to any indeterminate problem. This ends the introduction, the formal introduction, to the flexibility method.